So uh, today I'm gonna talk about Taplin, and we will try. I'll start by explaining what Taplin is and how it's done via um, usual methods, and then uh, talk a little bit more about how Taplin can be done via constructive algorithmics. Uh, so I'll start by explaining what Taplin is. Uh, it's basically a program transformation technique which groups functions uh, with the same arguments together. Um, it can also um, group functions which um, use parts of the arguments or some kind of data which is common for them. Uh, all of this done is to eliminate multiple traversals of the same data structure and thus improve the performance of the program and to eliminate redu uh, redundant recursive calls. Um, this particular idea uh, has been um, around for a while. It started in like 70s uh, when people were discussing how to write programs um, more or less like properly. And uh, it uh, since then transformed a little bit uh, so that there is also uh, there is even uh, automatic procedures which can couple um, functions together. I'll start by providing some example. So uh, if you've ever been to any of my talks, you've probably seen the maximum and length example where a single list is traversed uh, and uh, we compute the maximum value of the list and its length uh, at the same time. So um, the naive version uh, you can come up with uh, while, while trying to um, tackle this problem is um, this kind of implementation where you have a maximum function, a length function, and they both are just recursively uh, defined uh, by traversing the list and doing uh, what they are meant to do. And then you tuple the result together and return it uh, just simple as that. Of course, this particular implementation is not very good because it traverses the list twice instead of uh, only one time and thus is inefficient. A more smart way would be to implement it in such a way that the list is only uh, traversed once and you compute both maximum and minimum uh, and the, the length of the list uh, at the same time. So if you have an empty list, your maximum and length are both zero. And if you don't, if you have a const list, then you can uh, recursively call it on uh, the same function on the tail of the list, get a tuple of maximum and length temporarily valid for the tail, and then you uh, compose the result uh, for, for, the, for the whole call. Of course, this fun function would be a little bit better because it will only traverse uh, the list once uh, and thus be uh, faster. But of course, this comes with the price of this function being much more elaborate. So you don't, you cannot follow as easily what happens in this function as uh, compared to the simple implementation. Um, Another example would be uh, to compute the average number of the list. And here, uh, where, uh, and here is uh, an example where Taplin is not as pronounced. Uh, at least we don't. Uh, we don't uh, manipulate the tuple as itself. So if you want to compute the average of the list, we will first uh, compute it's uh, the sum of the elements of the list via uh, the simplest uh, sum, summing function and then we'll compute the length of the, of the list and then we will divide by one by the other and get the result which we are looking for uh, and smarter function would uh, use a auxiliary auxiliary <laughs> A helper function average, uh, which is a tuple function, and the tuple here is the same way as we computed uh, both maximum and the length of the list in the previous example. It will compute the sum of the list and the length of the list while 
uh, traversing the list only once. And then use this uh, both values to compute the average number of the list. Here, this example is a little bit more um, uh, more realistic in terms that you don't really uh, you don't really need two values computed uh, by traversing the list. You need only one value, and the way you traverse the list is a little bit up to you. And it's up to you to make it so you traverse the list only once. And uh, so uh, all these ideas uh, were, were in the like in the general area of how to write functions better. So uh, there were this paper uh, published in the 1977 uh, called a transformation system for developing recursive programs where uh, the authors uh, described a way to write uh, programs in like a, a little bit higher level uh, as opposed to uh, thinking about all the details of uh, traversing your data structures and stuff like that and uh, the objective of the authors were to provide a framework to transform a simple uh, and obviously correct programs into more efficient ones which we which does not uh, um, traverse the data structures multiple times which do not uh, do redundant recursive calls and thus is a little bit more effective and uh, efficient and um, this is done um, by using some kind of uh, simple transformations which are more or less correct uh, like by construction and uh, this particular paper was uh, the one which gave rise to the fault unfold framework which is a one of the most prominent frameworks in the program transformations community and uh, the transformations described in the paper are basically uh, these six things. You can either define a function, you can instantiate it, uh, you can unfold or fold its definitions, you can use abstraction to, um, to, um, to extract some, uh, some data from, from, from the function calls. And you also can use laws uh, such as community TV, so some laws which are general, which are true in your particular domain uh, in which you are uh, programming. So let's uh, take a look at these uh, transformations uh, on uh, with a particular example in mind. So uh, the Fibonacci sequence is something which is, <laughs> I, th I hope, is uh, familiar. Everyone is familiar uh, to the with it. And uh, here on the slide, I put the most simple, the most dumb uh, implementation of Fibonacci numbers ever. And of course, this implementation uh, is extremely inefficient. It's exponential, and you will probably not. Uh, survive to uh, see um, like a thousandth number of uh, Fibonacci computed by this particular function. And um, while I, I'll discuss these uh, transformations, we will probably come up with a better implementation for the Fibonacci, um, which uses Taplin uh, as its core. So uh, the first transformation is definition, and it's a basically a way to introduce a new recursive equation. Uh, in this particular thing, in, in this particular um, transformation, you are allowed to do whatever you want. You can combine whatever calls you have in your program, but the new um, function should be a new function. It should not be uh, an instance of any other um, functions in your code. So you your, your name should just not clash. So for example, we can um, you, we can define a function g, which is a tuple of uh, Fibonacci number, uh, which is a successor of the of its parameter and the Fibonacci number for for the for, for this parameter itself. 
uh, then we have instantiation. Instantiation is basically if you have some information known about uh, your parameters, you can um, you can stick it into the right hand side of your function. So, for example, if you want to compute uh, g for zero, you know that is it is a Fibonacci for zero plus one and Fibonacci for zero. Um, then the first transformation, which is not um, that uh, trivial, uh, it's it is an unfolding transformation. Uh, in this particular thing, we just find some left hand side of an equation uh, within the program which we are trying to uh, improve, and we replace it with the right hand side of the same equation. So if you have this g applied to zero, we know that it's a Fibonacci for one and Fibonacci for zero, and we know that they are uh, up, they are defined uh, to be ones. So we can now by unfolding this Fibonacci one and Fibonacci zero calls uh, to ones that g applied to zero is a tuple of two ones. Uh, abstraction uh, is a way to um, incorporate into our program some um, auxiliary, auxiliary um, variables. So we basically add a WHERE clause. Uh, if we consider uh, g applied to n plus 1 to successor of some number, uh, we know that it's fib n plus 2 and fib n plus 1. And then by unfolding, we can unfold the fib n plus 2 just by the uh, definition of the Fibonacci uh, function. And we can see that fib n plus 1 is repeated here. Uh, the simplest way to improve a program is not uh, compute the same thing twice. So we can abstract it away uh, into some kind of variable and we can uh, abstract it in such a way that uh, we compute f, uh, I'm sorry, uh, this is a FIP, uh, FIP uh, n plus one only once. So here we know that g n plus one would be u plus v and u where u and v uh, are computed by the Fibonacci for um, n plus one and n. And uh, after that, uh, after we have this some kind of uh, structure which repeats the right hand side of some equation within our program, we can replace it with the left hand side of the definition. So this particular thing, uh, FIP n plus one and FIP n, are just the definition of GN, right? So we can re replace it uh, back into uh, GN by folding, what's called folding. Folding is basically uh, in, in some way a, um, a a dual to unfolding. So in unfolding, we replace the uh, left hand side with the right hand side. And here we find the right hand side and try to replace it with the left hand side. And by doing this, by doing this, we come up with the implementation for G, which is uh, which doubles the our numbers, which if we com com combine it with a, an with a definition for G0 will get us a function which will be helpful to um, to define Fibonacci in uh, linear time. And other transformation, which is a group of transformations, is loss. So you basically rewrite equation uh, using some laws which are valid in your domain. So if you have arithmetics, you know that zero plus one is one always, you know that it's com uh, commutative and you know that um, addition and multiplication are distributive. Uh, so you can distribute your multiplication across the addition. Uh, of course, like these transformations are helpful as a framework of thought, but uh, you should be what 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 this uh, approach does not do it does not work does not do all the work for you so you have to come up with which uh, with something which is called eureka tuples 
and this is a basically uh, you think really hard you uh, explore your domain and you know that this particular function can be improved if you uh, define this kind of function which tapples your uh, your input program uh, in, so, in some way uh, and of course uh, Eureka uh, tuple is a, a real is a real hurdle in your in your approach because uh, this is something which really uh, impedes uh, your your uh, it doesn't allow you to automate this framework uh, this approach easily even though you have some transformation which we already covered uh, and you can come up with this implementation for your uh, function you still have to do the the like critical the hard work yourself you have to restructure your function in some way uh, so that you don't do uh, the job twice and of course this was not satisfactory this was a good way to think about your programs and program as a like as a programmer but this is this does not really help you to uh improve your programs in such a way as uh compilers do for higher order languages for example uh, you still have to write code which is efficient so there was a, a lot of works uh, since then which we are trying to uh, come up with a more automatic way to improve programs so in 1984 Albert, Al, alberto petarossi came up with this pow powerful strategy for deriving efficient programs by transformation which was a um, an uh, it was an application of the um, previous work uh, summed up, to, uh, summed up with, to uh, transform your programs more or less uh, automatically in in more like structural way. Uh, it's not it's not that you can you could write a program which will transform transform your uh, programs uh, by itself, but you will have at least some kind of uh, algorithmic way to think about your eureka tuples to come up with them more easily so uh of course uh the objective of the pro of the paper was not uh, uh it was uh more general than just to find a way to derive eureka steps but uh in this um, talk this is the most crucial part for us and uh basically what uh, Tarossi does did uh he um, provided a way to uh to explore uh, your program and to see what kind of calls can be tabled together uh, in hope to uh to make a more efficient programs uh to do that uh he came up with this a uh, progressive sequence of cuts uh, definition, which is basically a way to cut across the dependency graph of your program, and to and then to uh, consider them and find places which in some way repeat themselves, and then if you see something repeating, you can you can probably make a tuple out of it and then improve your program by that. Um, so I'll I'll just spent a little bit more time about on this approach uh, to show how like complicated it is i think um, so basically um, what he does is that you get a dependency graph and then you can find some set of nodes in it uh, and this set of nodes should be um, such that if we remove them from the graph along with all the incoming and outcoming edges from uh, from these nodes uh, we get a disconnected a couple of dis uh, disconnected graphs um, in which all the nodes are um, ordered so basically you will have all ancestors in one graph and all, all descendants in the other graph you will not have this uh, thing that you uh, have a ancestor and this descendant and ancestor and descendant in uh, different parts of the of your graph and 
cuts are, are useful in this particular in this uh, particular sequence where you will find your like top ten candidates. And progressive sequence of cuts is basically a set of cuts, each of which is uh, computed out of the previous one by removing some um, some um, senior nodes and adding some newer, uh, like younger nodes. And younger and senior is here uh, the those in access ancestor descendant relation. So. Each cut you add in this particular sequence should at least remove one senior node and add one younger node, uh, so that in the difference between between them uh, there were properly ordered nodes um, present. So uh, let's see an example. Uh, here we have a an implementation for a function which. Uh, solves the Hanoi Tower problem. So we will have a function which uh, has a number of your uh, of your tower, the length of your tower, and then you'll have um, and you'll have pins and you'll have to remove some of the uh, the topmost um, disk from one of the uh, pin and remove it to the next pin. And here, this is a basic uh, implementation we will ha you will have uh, for kind of towers implemented, which is, of course, not ideal because it repeats a lot of computations. And if you, if you construct the dependency graph for that, you will have something uh, which looks like this. Here, um, we can see the cuts. Uh, which you can do uh, in order to split uh, the graphs into two parts. And um, if we uh, consider them carefully, we know that um, they um, in some way um, look alike. So basically, if you find this series of cuts, you will then find those which match. And then you tuple them together and re re rearrange your program in such a way that um, your Hanoi Tower are a little bit more um, efficient program. Uh, this tabling strategy approach is uh, quite good in, in the way that it at least uh, made you some framework of mind so you can uh, consider not abstract function in your head, but it's dependency graph, which at least somehow guides you. But of course, it's not fully automatic, and the author uh, realizes it, and it provi he provides provides us with a couple of heuristics which can help you um, to come up with the proper um, cut sequence. So. Uh, uh, one of them is to look for repeated computation while building the uh, dependency graph, and that you de can build dependency graph by uh, interleaving steps of uh, unfolding and trying to come up with a tuplin and doing some other transformations and stuff like that. And uh, the other heuristics is just uh, try to not unfold those recursive calls, uh, which can be derived from the cuts uh, from the calls which are already present in your cut, uh, which you are trying to explore now. And uh, the heuristic two uh, is aimed at the situations where uh, your dependency graph just does not uh, seem to be uh, in such a way that you can find the matching uh, call the cut se sequence where it grows uh, width-wise. And this is a kind of way to tame it. But of course, it does not really help uh, for some programs because some pro programs cannot be uh, described in such a way. So the next uh, paper in this series was uh, towards an automatic tuppling strategy, which came, I think, the closest to um, coming up with the uh, something which you can encode. 
and uh, its objective was to develop to develop a fully automatic tablet algorithm. Uh, of course, it is not achieved it for any uh, like for uh, any recursive program imaginable, but it at least uh, uh, lists a good uh, characterizations or characterization of a, of your functions which can be um, transformed using this algorithm. It uh, has uh, a particular algorithm uh, of uh, constructing this sequence of cuts. Uh, basically, if you have a cut, you find among them all the most senior nodes, you remove them and you add into your cut uh, its, its uh, descendants. And uh, if uh, the cut you get um, match something uh, which is which has been uh, explored before, then uh, you can double the uh, the candidate, and otherwise you just need to explore the cuts further. And uh, this implementation was was really good in terms that it uh, described how to deal if your um, function have if your functions have multiple uh, recursive functions which work on the same uh, data types, uh, on, on, with the same data structures, and um, how to deal with uh, situations where you have multiple recursive parameters. Uh, and it came up with this uh, idea that you don't need to explore the sequence of cuts, you, you can explore the tree of cuts, uh, and uh, in this tree of cuts, you can uh, select only those cuts which um, which match its predecessors and stuff like that. And but of course, uh, it would not be. I would. I will not talk about other approach if this was uh, like generally uh, applicable. It only guarantees termination if uh, your function have a single recursive parameter and uh, it is strictly decreasing, no parameters can be accumulating, and uh, all the variables in recursive calls, like in, in the body of the recursion of the recursive function, uh, should uh, come with from the recursive parameters. And uh, the paper also shows that sometimes preprocessing uh, can be used to transform function in this form, so we'll, you, you can transform Fibonacci numbers, for example, in this form, but it still needs a clever control uh, to deal with infinite unfolding because uh, you can unfold at any point in your transformation, but not on all unfolding is good and not unfolding can uh, lead you to discovering this tuppling and then um, improving your program. And uh, since it comes with a lot of overhead and a lot of costs, it's not easy to implement in a real, real compiler, and we still don't see these implementations even now. So, uh, to battle it, uh, people in uh, so people came up with this stopping calculation idea. It uh, was presented at the ICFP, like the second edition of ICFP in 1997. Uh, they, they were um, battling the problem of making Taplin algorithm which can be used in a real compiler. And they were seeing Taplin not via fault and fault transformation, but via constructive algorithms. So they basically decided that category theory can help us in this problem. In this, in this uh, particular example, they used uh, Mutu theorem which is uh, which uh, shows us how to create top doubled definitions and uh, then from there you can uh, transform your programs uh, so constructive algorithms of algorithmics is uh, this way to view your programming as a uh, a bunch of catamorphisms, basically. So uh, you 
represent whatever data type you have as a polynomial and a functor, and then you throw some functors in that, uh, so some catamorphisms in that, so you can transform your um, data into some useful information. And by doing that, you can not only use this Mutator theorem, which uh, shows us how to uh, create tuplin definitions, but also other laws uh, which can transform recursive functions. And let me start by reminding what a polynomial and a functor is and why we need it. So it's a basically a way to represent whatever that algebraic data type there is. Uh, so you have only four kinds of functors here. So you have identity, which uh, does not change uh, whatever argument it has uh, passed on. So whether it's an argument, uh, a value, or a function, it just uh, it just um, returns it. The constant uh, polynomial, uh, the constant and the functor, uh, will disregard whatever uh, object you throw at it, and it will uh, transform whatever. Uh, function you pass it into id then you have a product uh, which is uh, something like a um, cartesian so just a cartesian pro product for uh, for the elements of uh, of your uh, sets or whatever of your data types it comes with projection functions functions and it also can be defined on um on like functions if you have uh two ta two functions you can make a product out of them and if you apply it to a table of values you will have uh the first function applied to the first value and the second function applied to the second value and uh this helpful triangle i don't know how to uh, how to pronounce it but it will be just upward triangle function uh which uh applies uh, both functions to the same value and makes a tuple out of it. And the last and the functor we consider is a separated sum, uh, which uh, allows us to uh, distinguish from two, uh, two kinds of things uh, with this like label, basically. So uh, if you have then you, if you have a uh, separated sum of two functions, you can apply them. And if you have the value tagged with uh, like the first uh, element of the sum, you will have a first uh, function applied to it. And if you have the value tagged with the second element of the sum, you will apply the second function to it. And uh, uh, this operation of downward triangle, uh, it applies the suitable function to the suitable um, to the suitable uh, argument, disregarding these tags uh, supplied to it. So let's consider an example. Uh, so we have a list, uh, a polymorphic list, uh, which has a nil constructor and a cons constructor with some element uh, in it and some tail of the list inside, we can see that the functor defined in, which defines this uh, data type uniquely is a constant, uh, is the constant uh, for nil and, so was, uh, and uh, it is uh, constructed by a separated sum with a, with a I'm sorry, my cat is my meowing. And uh, we combine it uh, with the um, cross of the constant for the type of the element and the identity functor. And uh, in this world, we can have this uh, helpful functions in and out, which basically, uh, say how to construct values of our data type and how to deconstruct them. 
So uh, the construct, uh, the constructor for this data type will be just this downward triangle for nil and cones, and it basically will uh, apply uh, the nil or cones uh, to the proper arguments uh, supplied to it, and deconstruct something which uh, can deconstruct the value will see will be something like that. So it's basically the case um, the case expression uh, for the list, and then uh, we construct either yes it was the first constructor and this is the value which uh, is just the unit value which does not mean anything, or we can deconstruct the cons into a pair of the of the value and the list, and tag it with the second um, tag. If you have a tree, a binary tree which ha only have a which only has a value in its leaf leaves, uh, then uh, the uh, its functor will be like this, and uh, its a out function will deconstruct uh, in such a way that it will return the value of the leaf. Uh, if we, uh, we if the value we are trying to deconstruct is a leaf and if it's a node then it will uh, combine the left and the right subtrees and then tag it them with two and return them so uh, starting from that uh, we can go to a catamorphism catamorphisms is basically a way to um, to fold your structure to fold your data structure with some uh, helpful um, functions. So uh, for for the for list, uh, a catamorphism will will look like this. Here, uh, e is uh, e and plus are just just functions which uh, do something with the corresponding uh, subparts of the list substructures of the list, and they uniquely define our catamorphism. So uh, it's the catamorphisms are usually written in this kind of brackets, and uh, we combine uh, these basic functions uh, into, into that with the downward triangle operation. And uh, this may be seen as replacing the um, constructors within our list with the corresponding operation e for nil and plus for cons and this is quite general uh, to express a lot of uh, recursive functions catamorphisms come up, come with this uh, helpful characterization which basically says that uh, we to to apply uh, Phi function, we have to decompose whatever uh, whatever value we have uh, by means of our functor, and then apply it to whatever um, substructures we have, and then compose them back together. Let's see if at an example, and here I have to like excuse myself because I didn't. By this time, I ran out of time to prepare slides, so I stuck a lot of screenshots into it. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, what happened? Uh, so yeah, uh, from from here on, you will see a lot of uh, slides from the original uh, paper, and I hope it will not detract from, from the presentation a lot of uh, too much. So if we have uh so one of the examples of catamorph catamorphisms uh like helpful catamorphisms for uh lists is a sum function which we've already seen uh which can be described by two parts zero which we return for nil and plus which uh replaces the cons in our data structure to continue to come to to calculate our uh some of the elements uh, of our list. So if we start by this uh, definition, 
And then we can apply our catamorphism characterization into it and get uh, this. Uh, yes, bananas, right? <laughs> and uh, then you uh, then you uh, just basically remind yourself what in function for our uh, particular list is and what uh, kind of uh, how does a functor for list uh, works on the function which you uh, stick into it. So since a functor is just uh, functor for list is just this, it's a constant and a constant and an identity, uh, we get that by applying a functor to a function f, we get this kind of function. We stick it all in our uh, in our definition and then apply some laws for this um, for all these operations, and then we we'll get this this implementation. And this says that then you just need to uh, to uh, just match uh, both parts of the triangles and get the implementations of your sum in terms of uh, basic functions. And since you come up with this string, you can uh, rewrite it into some kind of program form, which can be used as a definition of your, um, of your function in your favorite programming language. So we know that sum for nil should be zero, and sum in case we applied cones should first apply uh, should apply plus to the result of this cross product, and uh, it it just says that whatever you get on the first part of your cones, you should apply id to it, and whatever you get on the, as a second part of your cones, you should apply sum to it. So thus you get this plus x sum access uh, to get your uh, implementation for function sum. And uh, so now when we are reminded what catamorphisms are, I'll just throw this Mutu-Tuplin theorem into you. Uh, it may come as like, just total nonsense but what it does it uh, explains how and what kind of functions you can uh, tuple and how you can do it so basically to tuple two functions f and g you can construct a catamorphism out of two functions phi and psi uh, which come from this two definitions for f and g functions themselves and you can see that f and g uh, kind of like uh, uh, catamorphisms, but not, because here we, do, we don't have just G and here we don't have just F, we have this tuplin thing. So what it says that you can find functions which traverse the same data structure uh, in some kind of specific regular way. And once you've done it, you can tuple them and, tuple it, and tuplin is done just by uh, constructing the catamorphisms from two uh, these two specific uh, phi and psi functions. And so I think it's time to, I, again, come to the examples because this particular theorem can just go like over your head and you will not even understand it unless you can see with your eyes what, how, how it can apply, how can it be applied. So the example program which we will be consider is a function which finds the list of all the deepest leaves of your um, of your tree. And uh, if your tree is just a leaf, then of course the deepest leaves is uh, a list of all of only one leaf, and you return it. But if it's a tree. Uh, if this is a node with two subtrees, then you need to uh, assess both subtrees, uh, pick the one which has uh, whose depth is 
is greater and then collect leaves from that. And if you have um, both trees having the same uh, depth, then you concatenate the uh, list of uh, leaves which you collected uh, in both of the um, subtrees. And since you see here depth in the um, in the condition, you can clearly see that this particular implementation is not efficient at all because it will uh, traverse both um, subtrees to, to, cal to calculate depth of them and then it will traverse it again uh, to get the list of leaves. Uh, so to topple it, you need to, one way you can do by, by using the MUTO uh, theorem is uh, start by rewriting your program in, uh, in this particular um, in this particular form. So we had to write a function so that it is a composition of some other function with a functor applied to the toppled uh, version of uh, two uh, function you are going to topple. So here uh, we can uh, apply, we can uh, so we have this deepest and depth um, combined with a triangle, which means that they both contrib contribute their results and we can use them, basically. Uh, so to rewrite this function, we can uh, redefine it in terms of phi, of, uh, which is uh, in terms is described why uh, via uh, phi 1 and phi 2. And phi one uh, only deals with the case where we have a leaf, and if it is a leaf, we can just return whatever uh, comes uh, into it as a parameter. And if it's not a leaf, then uh, the second function uh, takes place, and it uh, gets as uh, its input a couple of uh, results which this combination provides. So basically you'll have TL and HL, where TL is uh, the result of application of deepest function to the left subtree, and HL will be the result of the application of, of depth to uh, the left subtree. And the same is, uh, is true for the right subtree. And then you just combine them uh, in a similar fa fashion uh, which you've seen in the original implementation. So if you have depth of the left uh, subtree greater than the, the depth of the right subtree, then we just uh, return the result for the left subtree. If it's uh, less than, then we uh, return the result for the right subtree. And if they are equal, we combine them by using concatenation. Depth is the same in, in some way, uh, but here we disregard whatever the uh, results, the deepest function provided, and uh, just con compute the depth from the depth of two subtrees. And once we have these two um, representations of our input function functions, we can uh, craft the implementation of the deepest function as a projection of this uh, pair of functions, which is in turn um, can be represented as this catamorphism uh, combined from the phi and psi functions. I hope it makes sense. If it doesn't, just ask questions and we will go through this example in a little bit more details. I think I have a question. Great. Uh, so my general understanding is that mutomorphism and your mutu theorem is ha ha somehow related to this stuff. And uh, the, as, I just, as far as I understand the idea behind that, that you have two functions that call each other. So it's called mutomorphism and mutual stuff. I understand how deepest calls itself and depth, but I am not understand how depth function calls deepest and where it happens. Because uh, phi one from a equals zero 
is uh, is a very simple definition of using the first function i think maybe a mutomorphisms are not essential for this example and the canonical one is probably usually uh, something like uh, evaluating the oddity of a number when uh, you decrease a number and call even and decrease one uh, decrease it once again and call odd function so we, you have two functions that are mutually recursive but this uh, seems not mutually recursive yeah this particular example is not uh mutual in terms that both function call each other but uh this is not the like the this is not really important for depth function because it does not really depend on deepest which is like for 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 our domain is normal but deepest depend on depth and uh we do this transformation only that only in in hope to construct the implementation for deepest itself and not for depth and we could not do it otherwise because our mutu tuplin uh really depends on all the function being uh expressed in terms of the tuplin and once you have uh this uh representation then you can either project the first function or the second and get the result but whether it will be reasonable for depth is of course is not it's not reasonable it's not really something that you should do uh, in original paper maybe they had something called ziga theorem i mean ziga morphism is uh, basically one extra function which doesn't uh, cause the original one so there is no mutual recursions here it is more simple concept or they they had uh, immediately mutual theorem and stuff like that uh this was the first theorem they considered and they did not uh, see they did not use this ziga morphism yeah sorry um uh, okay there is a more general um uh, as far as I understand, there is a general program transformation tool which is called HILO, H Y L O, uh, which is a, I, I, as far as I understand, which uses more of the different kinds of morphisms and laws for them to transform programs. So maybe if you are interested, you can check them out. Uh, I know about HILO, which is anamorphism after catamorphism, but it is seems not to be more general it seems to be another branch or something of hierarchy of morphisms no it's not just like hilo morphisms it's a particular uh program transformer tool which may use different kinds of morphisms inside of it a tool called hilo yeah exactly ah okay yeah I, I, I haven't really checked whether it's uh, whether it's still uh, working and it's still uh, survived, <laughs> but this is something which uh, were cited and this particular work was cited from that. So I, I think this is a something you are interested in. So let me continue probably. Um, so the main property of the approach and the main claim the authors make is that by doing this particular uh, transformation we can eliminate all multiple data tra traversals but only by like what they call tuplable functions uh, in a program and uh, the tuplable function is quite a broad um, kind of function uh, which is of course, this class of function is less general than uh, the general unfold fold transformation applies to. But of course, fold and fold transformation is a lot of has a lot of heuristics and eureka stuff which you have to come up with yourselves. 
And this is the power of their approach that at least for some function, they can do uh, transformations completely automatically. And uh, let maybe uh, circle back and uh, discuss what multiple data traversals is and what tuplable function is. So a multiple data traversal and something which they are replacing is uh, the situation where you have two calls of functions which uh, address the uh, arguments which for which one of them is a sub pattern of the other. And sub pattern is basically if you have a constructor and you have something inside of it. So it is a sub pattern, but you cannot construct new stuff out of the pieces and you cannot really uh, like combine it using some other functions randomly. And tuplable functions. Uh, itself is a set of multiply, uh, mutually recursive functions, which all are defined by some kind of equations where it's only the first argument is a pattern. So this is something you uh, apply your case analysis to. And uh, in each of the bodies of these implementations, uh, whatever you call, whatever function you call, you have to ensure that its pattern is a sub-pattern of, uh, of the original pattern. And let's just see a couple of examples which illustrates this uh, definition. Uh, first is a rep function which does, which does something for, uh, for our trees. And you can see that in the right-hand side, it uh, calls, it has a recursive call to rep and it uses subtrees themselves and does not do anything more specific or more complete with them. And here is a non-example where we have a function foo, which works for a list, uh, which has at least two elements, x1 and x2. And uh, this particular body is not uh, allow, does not allow us to call this function tuplable because uh, this uh, recursive call, the first recursive call, it uh, applies some uh, function to the um, the second element, and the third, the second application, it disregards the second element altogether and constructs a new list. So these two things is not allowed. You cannot construct new stuff out of pieces, and you cannot apply uh, random functions to of them um, to construct new uh, kind of, but not really uh, that, that, that structures uh, which resemble the, the input ones. And uh, for the tuplable functions, it is uh, correct that you can always, uh, you can always represent them in this long standard form. This long standard form, uh, is a mouthful, uh, but basically it says that um, you can see f as a as a composition of functions, which uh, provides a case analysis. So destruct your value for up to one, uh, only once, twice, and up to seven times. So you can you can go seven level. Uh, I'm sorry, not several l levels deep inside your structure, you can apply H to them, and then you can, um, so in, in the end, and then you apply the function H to the, the pieces. And H function is a combination of uh, F functions, which are mutually defined with F, and G functions, which are not mutually recursively defined with F, but are still tuplable functions, and so, our approach can apply to them. And uh, of course, the uh, powers is just uh, the regular notion of the power for, for, for our uh, function. And decomposition can be done by appropriately decomposing the subparts of your uh, of your data structure. Um, so, 
then there is four uh, rules which help you to manipulate your standard representation. So if you remember, you have to make your functions all have the same, um, use the same uh, toppled, uh, toppled like bodies. So you have to make sure that your functions are all looking the same. And this is done by using these four rules, which I will not go through uh, the, um, the details of, but uh, so basically the first rule allows us to increase the depth uh, up to which we, uh, we decom deconstruct our uh, values. And then we apply the, um, the projection so that we don't, so we disregard that uh, depth of, uh, of, of deconstruction. And then uh, you can use this the second rule to add new uh, functions h to your uh, like to your uh, h function, and you can use r three to exchange the positions within them. So you can reorder your tuples basically. And the fourth. Uh, it is just a way to generalize your Mutu theorem for the standardized uh, way, uh, the, for the standard um, representation for recursive function. So it's the same as we've seen, but here we can uh, unfold, uh, our, deconstruct our, our, our argument up to the some, some kind of depth. And then this is a way that you construct the tuppled value for that, for, for, for the function. And uh, so uh, one of the main theorems in the paper is the tuppling, tuple, tuppleable function theorem, which says that uh, if you have a bunch of tuppleable functions, which can be represented in this particular form, then you can tuple them. And uh, here, uh, P is just a projection which helps to uh, to so post process some in some way the, your values so you disregard whatever is not needed. And phi is a composition with a triangle operation uh, which is constructed from the from the catamorphisms which define our mutually recursive functions. And so let's consider a, a little bit more uh, involved example uh, of uh, application of our um, approach. So we get we go back to Fibonacci numbers, and uh, this is an example where you have to decompose your data type at least twice to get any reasonable any any useful information out of it. So you can you can uh, transform your Fibonacci into this form. Uh, this is a standard form uh, for for Fibonacci rec recursive equation, and uh, here it uses uh, functors for natural numbers and functor of functor for natural for natural natural numbers and uh, so it only also uses the uh, deconstructor and twice applied deconstructor so uh, the functor for natural number uh, which has only two constructors which is a zero and the successor of uh, natural number is a constant plus id uh, identity identity functor and for the twice applied functor you will have a constant plus constant plus uh, identity and for deconstructor we will have out which is a simply defined deconstructor which just throws uh, which is just uh, takes an out of the successor if there is a successor and uh, does nothing if there is a zero constructor and for twice applied out we will have this monstrosity where we will uh, go inside uh, the number if and then uh, deconstruct it and get a another like 
value coupled with all these tags. And um, since we de defined these uh, parts, we can rewrite our Fibonacci in the in this particular way. So we have to write it as a phi uh, combined with this um, this uh, case expression, where we apply uh, our Fibonacci to whatever results we get. So, so uh, you can see that we uh, we get a tuple for just zero results for zero, and then if if it is a successor, then we'll have a Fibonacci applied to uh, our number minus one, and then we will have one level deeper the Fibonacci for n minus two basically. And if we compare it to the original implementation of FIB, which is uh, restructured in such a way that we have this case um, analysis explicit, then we can uh, get what phi is supposed to be out of that. So then we uh, can see that the definition of phi is just uh, this lambda expression where which either which explores which explores one two three four uh, different options uh, I'm sorry three different options and it just do what like you are expecting it to do so it will plus it will add up the results which we get from uh, the Fibonacci n minus two and uh, then in, and a result for Fibonacci n minus one, which we we'll get here. And once we've done all that, we can uh, apply the Mutu theorem and get uh, the this kind of uh, equation. And by rewriting it back into a uh, somewhat readable form, we will get the uh, the perfect implementation for Fibonacci, which is uh, just which just uses uh, tuplin the same way uh, our G function uh, done in the first in the first part of the talk. And so yeah, and uh, this is like this is the whole idea. So you will get a program. You will have some kind of, of functions inside of the function of the program, which you rewrite into a standard form, and then you compare it, match it, and then you rewrite everything into a tabled version, which is hopefully a little bit more a little bit more uh, efficient in such a way that it does not traverse the multiple uh, multiple multiple times the same data structures and it does not uh, call recursive functions which are redundant and so the so this is basically the uh, the whole approach and its uh, basic properties is that the algorithm works is correct it is correct because it uh, uses semantic preserving transformations at each of the uh, steps, it always terminates and uh, it always uh, eliminates all the multiple data traversals in uh, done by tuplable tup functions. Uh, among the uh, deficiencies, uh, among the limitations of the approach is that of course, tupled functions require extra memory because we have to construct and deconstruct tuples. And this is uh, something which uh, the compiler of your of your language should take care of. It should provide you with an efficient tupler implementation if, uh, if uh, this transformation should be uh, applied into it. So yeah, I think this is all that I have. The last page is just uh, literature if some, someone is interested in. Um, if anyone has any question, I will be 
delighted to answer them. Otherwise, you can just go. Thank you. It was rather a cool stuff. That would uh, help question. questions. I wonder if, if uh, this technique can be scaled up to logical and relational problems. Well, and, I I hope it does. <laughs> yeah, but but uh, the, the first question is that uh, you, you uh, this the, uh, this this framework is is based on type full representation of data structures. So you need a data type uh, represented at the fixed point of some of some in the function, and you need uh, to uh, you need to, to represent the functions catamorphism. That uh, I'm not sure what uh, all these terms would mean. Logical or relational, please. What 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 the catamorphism amounts to in logical system? Because okay, catamorphism is, is, is something which deconstructs, and uh, in relational setting, it's, uh, it's constructs in one direction and deconstructs in another. So it's sort of anamorphism in, in, in the opposite direction. So. so and uh, does anybody have any questions besides me? Because I, we can spend a whole day discussing this issue. No, nobody. Uh, yeah, thank you for a great talk. Uh, okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I want to check up my understanding. Uh, am I right that it is uh, just uh, straightforward to obtain uh, fees? From which we uh, build up uh, and use a mutual theorem, yeah, P in the bottom. So it's just a syntactical preprocessing of the input pro uh, program, yeah? Yes, yes. And uh, uh, the uh, whole uh, problem, mm. I'm trying to understand. It's just uh, decidable, and it's just ha has some bad complexity, like non-elementary or something. Am I right? What do you mean? Uh, so uh, you presented us a great line of research on the subject, uh, the and the main goal of the research was to obtain a procedure which always ter terminates. So, uh, it seems that uh, the problem is undecidable or something. Well, uh, for this stoppable function, it will always works. So, um... Uh, so there is a, a syntactical a syntactical class of programs for yeah, which so it's uh, a stoppable functions mm -hmm. which uh, have been defined here. So you'll have mm -hmm. a set of functions which uh, have this limitation that they have a like the pattern something which will you you will deconstruct by using your out functions uh, presented at first as a first argument and all the um, functions which appear in its, in their bodies should use a um, should have these uh, pattern arguments as sub patterns of original one. So you don't have uh, accumulative uh, arguments. You don't have a clever manipulation with your uh, with your parts of sub patterns. You cannot construct new um data 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 values out of the pieces of the original pattern of, unfortunately and some of these uh limitations can be rectified and some of them of course does not work in like in general and the authors uh, say that uh, we realize that our uh, implementation our um, approach is quite limited in terms of what kind of functions they can uh, transform, but it's work. It works at least automatically, and you don't have to think about this kind of stuff with your brain. And 
as, as, as opposed to the general fold fold, fold and fold transformation, uh, which has limitations, which I did not come in, like into more details, but um, it's still very general and very ad hoc and uh, re requires uh, a human to actually come up with the clever ideas and this Eureka tuples and stuff like that. Okay, thanks. And the other question I have uh, uh, again about those uh, th uh, fees uh, is that um, uh, fee and PC are uh, single, uh, let's say, unrolling of the original function. Am I right? They are not unrolling of the function by themselves. Yeah. Uh, I use an analogy, so um, the uh, their uh, let's say isomorphic to the original fun function body enrolled once. Am I right? So yeah, they basically uh, it's just a rewriting of this of the of the original fun function uh, in some kind of way uh, using other. Uh, maybe using and maybe not uh, the results of applying other functions to the subparts mm -hmm. but you can unroll your um, you can deconstruct your input whatever time how many times you uh, really need to get to the particular uh, sub argument which you have to explore with your function so you, for example, can uh, unroll one function once and the other multiple times. As far as I understand, this is what this particular um, rule addresses. So if you need to unroll something more than once, you just throw it out of the window if you don't need it for your particular function. It's when the uh, the question arises, uh, how should I know from uh, my original program how much times should I unroll which function ah I see what what's what's some what you are trying to uh, like decide this is this particular topic is just a syntactic um, syntactic check for your definition so you have a bunch of definitions in your program and you can see how deeply you go inside your mm -hmm. pattern. So this this particular thing is not an issue. You can always so by syntactical limitation of our uh, uh, program class, well, we already know the, the depth. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. You can see no, the depth just from the from mm -hmm. your implementation. Thanks. More mm -hmm. more questions. I'll uh, let them stop. Thank you, Katya, for the presentation of this talk. Thank you. And, uh, see everybody next. Bye-bye. Goodbye.